So I don't have to say anything in a biography, but let's just start sort of the back of the room and have you just so everybody get to know each other a little bit before we get started. So that's okay with you. Yeah. yeah. I'm Jim. Okay. I'm Dan. Dan. I'm, I'm Ron. I'm Dan's father. Great. Zach Angel. Dave, lifelong Raider A. Yeah, it's also about things like 10 by 10.
Grandma still can't forgive me. No, she just says, I don't know, I, I thought I raised her right. <laughs> I'll go, I'm Sean, I grew up in Oakland, uh, I grew up with Billy Ball, and uh, actually got married on Saturday, and I, my wife walked to the Giants fan when we met, and on, on our, her, her vows, she committed to me in a series. <laughs> 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 we actually, I drove and went back to Boston for my bachelor party, we saw the eighth Boston series, and we took a picture, and we got on the CSN fan photo a couple weeks later, so we were so stoked, so everybody was calling me saying our, our picture was up, so that was a nice exciting year. Uh, my name's Emily. I'm a lifelong age fan, grew up in the East Bay. Uh, despite the fact that I told my mom I would marry Ricky Henderson, <laughs> I met this guy at an AC. All of us fast. So this is my husband who I met at an AC game 10 years ago. Uh, all right, I'm Adam. I've uh, been in the Golden Games probably, I think 79 was my first game. And we were sitting in the, uh, the wood bleachers. And it was great because it was always really cheap. It was two bucks for the pictures and a buck for beer. So my mother always said, go find some friends on the street and bring them to the game. <laughs> Watch and enjoy them. And I saw Ricky play and that was it. I went over that guy. Try to practice his stance and him. all that. And <laughs> I couldn't, I couldn't steal the bases. I mean, I was in that good. Really, really good games. A really exciting thing to watch. And I'm in Moneyball too. Great. <laughs> I uh, made signs. My first one was Kiss My Age. He's the guy holding the 18 sign in the, uh, during the stream. Uh, uh, the 18, 18. The, after the 18. Oh, okay. The main guy bobbled it. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Right on. It's a really nice sign. Yeah. Yeah. 
Um, I'm, I'm James, James. My publisher. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm James. Uh, I've been going to games since 1986. Uh, the very first game I was at, I remember Dusty Baker hit a home run for the A's. Uh, I went through the bash of those years, of course. I spent a lot of days out in the bleachers before getting closer to the play for photography. Um, one of the games I remember very vividly, uh, well, I was born in Castro Valley, but a lot of times, a lot of the time in Hayward. But I was looking at Alameda uh, when the earthquake hit. And uh, one game I went to around that time, they actually gave out flashlights uh, with batteries. <laughs> Different era, right? <laughs> My father was supposed to pick me up after the ball game. He fell asleep and left the answering machine on. So I ended up having to walk all the way home from the Coliseum to our house in Alameda, go to church the next morning. But uh, that flashlight came in very handy. <laughs> I've seen a lot of, uh, a lot of great eight days games over the years, early 2000s, the streak, um, just a lot of fun times at the Coliseum, so a lot of good times it's been built, too. Hi, Danielle. Welcome. Hi. Danielle is interning with Steve at the Wellstone Center, and she has some t-shirts, right? Yeah. That's awesome. <laughs> Thank you. I went to my first days game in the 70s because I was an aspiring broadcaster, and as I wrote in the book, I was the only person there who I really, it was really cool that only 763 people were going to the game. <laughs> <laughs> because I could spread out with whole sections with a cassette record. And young people remember that there were these things called cassettes. And, <laughs> and, uh, I would make audition tapes at the games in 78, 79, just uh, trying to get established as a broadcaster. I got my first job in 1980. Uh, but it's just wonderful to see everyone and to have you here. And the support that we've gotten for this book has been unbelievable. And when we first, Steve Kevin, who's the publisher of the book, approached me about writing the book. And this is literally the story of someone who's never written a book before and someone who never published a book before. <laughs> so Steve had this idea of trying, you know, there, obviously there's the reality, he had to raise some money. And so um, if that's why he developed the Kickstarter campaign. That I know you people all got behind, and we're so indebted and so thrilled. And I know it's taken a long time for us to kind of pull this together to get this together for tonight. But I'm thrilled that you all could be here. And um, it takes money, I guess, to get a book off the ground. Um, one of the biggest expenses actually was the cover, because Mark Ulrichson, who did the cover, is a renowned artist. Um, but we and Steve, especially, and we both felt it was really worth it to do it. And the cover has really, it's drawn a lot of attention to the book uh, because Mark's work is, is just amazing. And I think to have a, a cover that's a little off a little bit is kind of perfect for Bill. You, know? <laughs> <laughs> you didn't want just a, you know, just a uh, run of the mill photo or something. So um, that was the genesis of that. So, and the support that I've gotten from A's fans over all these years, you know, I wouldn't be here for 19 years doing the games if I didn't have this. Incredible support. I'm blown away by it. You know, um, and we've had good teams, and that makes it a lot easier. But, but still, I'm so indebted to the people that are supportive of this team. And the A's have the greatest fans. And they're just it's wonderful. Um, I feel like we're all kind of brothers or cousins or sisters, and we've all kind of been this through this together. And I moved here in 1979, and I've lived all over the Bay Area, and um, a lot of the same experiences. I think gone to the same restaurants or the same concerts or done the same things and I think we've all shared a lot in common. Um, stop me if I get too long-winded on talking about the book because I have such a passion for talking about it. But, um, obviously you know that I spent 10 years working with Bill and it was the most remarkable gift I've ever been get, given because he was an amazing guy and you all know that and I grew up listening to him. So I spent all these nights listening to the radio and tuning in late at night through the static, listening to Bill. And, and then when I moved here in 79, Bill was doing the Raiders and the Warriors, and he started with Juan in 81. I was living in Santa Rosa. We didn't have uh, cable, so radio was my link to the team, and I just loved listening to those games. And it really helped, you know, along with Vince Scully, who really was an idol in Chip Hearn, but Bill was an idol and was so instrumental in my love of sports and broadcasting. And I don't know, without someone like Bill or Finn or some of these other people, if I would have pursued the profession. 
And so when you spend 30 years listening to someone and revering that person, then you're, you wind up being paired with them. How many people get that opportunity? So the 10 years I spent with Bill made a profound, a profound impact on me um, as a person and as a broadcaster. And that's why um, I really wanted to write this book. Um, I've been approached by a publisher about maybe five years before we started the book project, this book, um, about writing my own story. And I had no interest in doing that. I just didn't feel that I had lived enough of a life or that interesting a life or that my story was that compelling. And this is a fairly significant publisher. And I mentioned this person that if I was going to do a book, that I'd like to write a book about Bill King. And I kind of threw it out there for this person who had made this overture to me. He had no interest in a Bill King book at all. He said it probably wouldn't sell, nobody would care. Well, I think we proved him wrong. <laughs> you know? um, so when I think it speaks to you know, following your heart and your passions, and I think if you really care about something, and you feel like you have a good story, and you feel like you can tell the story, and you feel like there are people that can tell the story along with you, that you can write a book, even if a publisher says, no, there's not going to be a lot of interest. And Steve Kepman was uh, the beat writer for the A's for the Chronicle shortly after I started working for the team. And he and Bill became close. And Steve grew up in the Bay Area. And like we had a lot of similar experiences growing up listening to Bill and idolizing Bill. And he approached me about this idea of writing a book about Bill. But it was, as I mentioned in the credits for the book, his idea was to do a much shorter book. Because to kick off Wellstone books, and again, Steve had never been down this road. He's a very accomplished writer and he's had best sellers but wanted to get into publishing. That he wanted to do a, what he would he said was going to be a mentor series of books where people would write these short books about people who made an impact on them and maybe get five or six people to do a series of books. But it was a great idea. Um, but once I started to get into it and I did a couple of the first interviews for the book, I told Steve, I said, you know, I can't do that. I think if we're going to do a Bill King book, let's do a Bill King book. And it can't, it has to be more than just 150 pages or 100 pages of my own reflections on the time of Bill, my own memories of what Bill meant to me. I thought we could incorporate that into the book. But even though the book is somewhat anecdotal and there's a random aspect to it that meanders a little bit, it's not a true biography from the standpoint that, you know, he wasn't in Mrs. Johnson's class in the third grade and when he was 80 did this and when he was 14 did this. I felt like since nobody had done a Bill King book, and because, um, let's face it, a lot of Bill's contemporaries are getting up there a little bit. And I hope they're around forever, but I didn't know how long they would be around. And I, I really felt this was the time to kind of go for it and uh, write the book. And then I got so inspired by the interviews. Um, the first interview that I did was with Hank Greenwald, who really was like a brother to Bill. They were incredibly close. Their families were close. And Steve and I had dinner with Hank um, up at uh, Perry's in San Francisco. We put a tape recorder down on the table. We just had lunch. And Hank just talked. And I went back and listened to it. And I thought, you know, this is the foundation for the book. It's right there. Because he started to fill in the blanks. And it was actually building a structure for where I thought we could go with it. Um, and then that night we had dinner with Kathleen, Bill's daughter. And like any daughter, um, she's very protective of Bill's legacy, and I don't blame her at all. And I think she was guardedly enthusiastic about us doing this. But I think that I think we had to show her the sincerity that we had in the project and kind of the way we were going to go about doing it. And I think as we got deeper into it, I think she provided an amazing amount of information for this book and to get her blessing. I have so much respect for Kathleen um, and, and she was so close with Bill. But then, you know, when you're Bill's daughter, you're starting to reveal some things that are personal. And do you really want those things in print? And, and I can understand where maybe someone maybe might be a little aggressive. Um, but to, to provide a lot of the background and a lot of information and some of the things that were like Will Chamberlain showing up in his Bentley and his legs filled up the whole living room. You know, those are priceless quotes that you get from someone. A lot of Bill's um, childhood and, and the background from his days back a long way that I didn't even know about. Uh, 
so we owe a huge debt to her. And I really, and I wrote this in the book, that having her blessing is like asking for you know, the father, you know, the blessing in, in marriage, you know, to marry a, <clears throat> someone's daughter, because that's how much it meant to me to get her blessing for the book. And then I set out and interviewed about 55 people for the book. And uh, I wanted to do justice to the A's, the Raiders, and the Warriors. Um, I had it in mind that I kind of felt like Bill's, Bill's history is woven into the history of the Bay Area. It's impossible to separate Bill from the fabric of Bay Area life, and especially Bay Area sports. And I was thrilled the other day, Brody Brazil, I have a lot of respect for works for CSN, is a lot younger than me, and he said he read the book and he thought it was a little bit of like a, a textbook, because he's trying to understand about Bay Area sports because he's a lot younger. And he felt that he learned a lot, and that meant so much to me to hear that from him. And so there's a little bit of a Bay Area history in there that I wanted to bring out. Um, yes, Mark. I just want to say that I kind of thought that, that uh, Pete Greenwald, did he do one season as a radio broadcaster after Lon Simmons left? He was absolutely horrible. With us? Yeah. yeah. And then you took over. No, he didn't. What happened with Hank was that he actually did TV. Oh, he did TV? That's right. He did TV. Right. I'm just guessing. It was the time when Greg Papa was kind of drifting in and out of doing TV for the years, and honestly, the time when they kind of wanted me to do it, and I turned down the TV job. And, um, and then when Bill had his accident in 05 during the spring in Arizona, Bill did a lot of radio with me that year in 05. It was Bill's last year, but Bill was just doing the home game. Um, but you know, Hank was legendary for his days with the Giants. Right, on radio. On and radio. I think they put him on TV and he was just doing And he didn't want it, and he didn't yeah. like doing And you could tell. But what yeah. I wanted to say was that, that um, when you slid into the seat next to Bill, it was very comfortable. It was like putting on an old pair of shoes. And when we lost Bill, having you there made that so much more bearable for me. And I think I'd probably speak for everybody. It was just, it was just so comfortable to have you there. And I also want to say that you have made Vince Catronio a better broadcaster. And I thank you for that. Thank you. <laughs> um, the the pairing with Bill was a dream come true for me. But it was ironic because I remember his one. It was one of my idols. I mean, I love Lon. I do Lon imitations. You know? <laughs> yeah. And, and so that was, it could have been really hard because, you know, Lon was iconic in his own way. And he and Bill had 15 wonderful years together. But Bill reached out to me and made that a lot more comfortable for me. So I owe Bill a lot. One reason I wrote the book is just to pay my debt. You know, I, I owe him so much because. Here was this legend, and he welcomed me in with open arms and was more than willing to make this new pairing work. Where a lot of people don't, you know, they wouldn't be so generous, and he really was. I don't think he would have done that for just anybody, though. I think he saw in you what he wanted to see. And well, thanks, Marjorie, but, you know, thanks to the A's for maybe seeing that a guy had some roots here in the Bay Area that maybe that might, might work for someone who grew up listening to Bill. Um, so anyway, we decided, you know, I started writing a book. And uh, after doing the after doing the interviews, I was so enthused about writing. I hang up the phone. Almost all the interviews have been over the phone. Some were done in a personal. Um, and I have. About, I was telling a couple of people here tonight. I have about 30 hours of recordings because everything that was done for the book is on is recorded. It would be a Herculean effort to put all that together. But there may be a great radio feature special in there somewhere. If, if someone ever has the time or I have the time. But I'd hang up the phone and I'd, I'd tell my wife or my daughter, um, I just, this is amazing that some people are saying, because Bill had this profound impact on people. It was unbelievable. Everybody I talked to, even the biggest stars like, a, you know, John Madden or Rick Perry, uh, Jason Giambi, uh, Roy Eisenhower, they couldn't wait, Billy Bean, they couldn't wait to talk about Bill and they were so cooperative in the project that it really was inspiring to me to try to write the story. So once I finished those interviews, I would almost try to call them in a way. I wrote, I kind of wrote the story of the interview. And then we'd try to do some research around that. If I was talking, let's say, Al Alice about the 75 championship, uh, then I would do some research around the 75 championship. Maybe talk to some other people. And then that 
kind of built the foundation for that 75 chapter. Um, I knew the winning streak was going to be part of the book because of how gracious Bill was to not come back and allow me to do the ninth innings of the 18th and 19th games. I get emotional just talking about it. Um, so I, and that was probably the most profound time in our relationship. Uh, and so I knew I had to do a, a chapter on the winning streak. But then you've got to talk to Art Howe, and you've got to talk to Hatterberg. Hatterberg's stuff I thought was golden for the book in that chapter. And other people um, that contributed to that chapter, some of the writers. And, um, I knew there had to be a chapter on Mother's Day. And uh, you know, when Ed Rush, who was the recipient of the X-rated barrage, <laughs> was willing to be forthcoming and say, I didn't have a real good night that night. Now this was 1968. And it was a long time after that, what, 44 years after that, or 45 years after that, I talked to him. And he had a vivid memory of it. Um, and uh, those are kind of golden things when you have that, you know, try to build a chapter around that. And I felt we had to set the record straight on what really happened that night, because a lot of people thought that the Warriors got fined, or Bill got fined, or he got a technical foul, or they were going to revoke Franklin's license. Um, <laughs> Uh, I knew there was going to be a chapter on uh, saving a guy, you know, losing a partner, which was a tough emotional chapter to write, very personal. And Steve Ketman and I had a little tug of war because he really wanted to pull me in the direction of making the book as personal as possible, and I wanted to talk to as many people as possible and kind of chronicles Bill, chronicle Bill's life through the eyes and the voices of the people he came in contact with. And I think we struck a happy medium. And I learned a lot about writing from Steve and also from Pete Danko, who became the chief editor of the book. Pete did a wonderful job editing the book, and they both gave me great direction. Um, because the editing process can be very tedious. And you take, a, you take ownership in a book when you write it. And then when you see it edited, you go, oh, no, I, you know, you're messing with my writing. But these are very accomplished writers who knew what they were doing. And I think even if there were times when there was conflict, I think it's all for the greater good. because. What we were trying to accomplish was write the best book we could and also do justice to Bill. And I think those were the two things that we kept in mind during the whole uh, process. And I'm kind of a tunnel vision person. It's a strength and a weakness because when I get into something, I'm like totally immersed in it. And it's not a real healthy thing to do. So I don't have that many projects like this in, in my lifetime that I can devote time to. But you know, when you're getting up at 3 in the morning with ideas for paragraphs and chapters and sentences, I don't think it's real healthy, but it does keep the creative process going, and I think when you're writing a book, it's important to keep that momentum going. And so I wrote, it took 10 months, and I did, I wrote almost every day during that time. Um, I would be doing games at night, or do my homework for the A's games during the day, and get up in the morning and write, or do it at night, or get up in the morning, and three in the morning with ideas. Um, I think that um, you know that's it's just kind of part of the process to keep the momentum going. And then once the book was published, the the response has been so unbelievably heartwarming to me because Bill died; it was very sudden, and it left a huge void when he passed away. It was you know it was very hard for people. And as I wrote, I don't know that people really had a chance to say goodbye. So maybe in a small way, the book has filled that void and allowed people to relive. Uh, some of the memories. Hank Greenwald wrote me a wonderful note after the book was published, and he said, I feel like I'm in a movie and I'm watching my life with Bill over again, and it brings me great joy to be able to walk through the steps of my life again through the book. Um, and I've heard from so many people. I got a, a letter yesterday from someone who took over the Portnoy Gallery, which is where Bill spent a lot of time with Nancy and some of his, um, his paintings were shown down there. It's just been, a, it's been an amazing journey to hear from people who seem to, you know, Bill's story has touched so many people. He was, he was a guy who made an impact in his life, and his life was so layered, and he was so authentic. He was really a, you know, a Bay Area original, and I hope that, that through the book, people got to know him a little bit better. So that was, that's kind of my story with it. Um, if you have any questions, I'd love to answer them. Anything we can talk about? Yeah.